Perfect, and we're live. Yay! And my mic is fixed. Thank yes. you. Yes. I won't hit it with the brim of my cap. Yeah. Right. So you, you did some mic No guarantee that I don't knock it out of my face. It's right. My gesticulations, but yeah. <laughs> so hey, everyone on the chat. Yay. Yeah, so we're yeah, about an hour earlier than we usually yeah, are because yeah. you don't have your... Uh, the lesson for this uh, might time. change since the two instructors we were supposed oh, to get uh -huh. are going elsewhere. Really, other yeah. companies or no, other no, branches? other other branches, oh, other okay. places. Like we're just not getting them. So I see. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we'll see. That's fun. Are they doing remote hiring? Are they hiring from? I mean, whatever it's called, overseas. Uh, overseas, yeah, overseas hiring. Yeah, yeah, we're doing overseas. Apparently, like prior to the pandemic, we had like a lot of people ready to come over. Mm -hmm. That's when we did like overseas teaching. As a way to kind of keep them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and kind of we promised them, yeah, okay, once this is all over, you'll be able to kind of come over. But it kind of opened the thing of like, we could teach from overseas, right? Right. <laughs> Not that they're going to do that, but mm -hmm. like my thought is like, why don't we just do that? Yeah, like, yeah. Because we need those fresh new bodies coming over <laughs> into the like chum machine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can't be exploited very easily no, remotely. You can't. Yeah, because no, you, you can just click you can just, disconnect yeah, call. Yeah, yeah, disconnect. yeah, I'm done. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think that's the the whole problem with room. I think, and that's that's. I think a lot of companies are having that right now. They're like, okay, get back in the office. Yeah. People are like, no, 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 no. We're, well, we're we're not gonna. Yeah, go hey, through that. onto politics and stuff like that. Yeah. But like, it, if your company is a normal company and a well-adjusted company where your success is measured by the things you achieve mm -hmm. rather than the hours you put in at your desk, then remote work seems great, right? You can do it from anywhere. Right. If you're a company like me, like, we don't care what you did. We only care that you took a certain amount of time to do it. <laughs> oh, and if you did faster? No, no, no. No, not, yes, no, 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 no. you still, you still got to be here. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah, and I remember the the little bit of uh, remote work I did where there was also people in the office. You're outside the po uh, politics loop mm. and everything. So, yeah, you get really, yeah, I, the... Uh, department shut down and we like learned the the day before it's like oh yeah you guys are done it's like everybody in the office was uh you know waiting nice <laughs> preparing for that news and no none of the remote people got any hey, well, well, they, don't need to, they don't need to clean up their stuff or do anything like <laughs> right. that yeah. yeah you don't need to carry that box out so why why even bother yeah. all right so uh yeah so hopefully anybody that's listening you're you're not dealing with that fighting with your company to yeah. stay uh stay at home while they're Trying to get you to commute again, get mm -hmm. in your car and uh, sit in traffic. <laughs> 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 Fun stuff. Yeah. All right. So, so what have you been up to? I've seen some uh, photos on uh, uh, Instagram, some minis. I've been trying out various combinations of the Frostgrave kits mm -hmm. just to see what kind of fits together. And they all pretty fit, much fit together. That's perfectly. great. The, the one, this is very much a me problem. The mm -hmm. thing I'm running into is like, Oh, I only have a box. I have like a box of these things, right? Like box of barbarians, cultists, soldiers, and I'm like, once you put those glue that glue yeah, on, right? It's... You've committed. Like, <laughs> right. oh, this is now a, a whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And looking at that unclipped out sprue, infinite possibilities, uh, right? Right, right? And then it's kind of like, and now it's set, <laughs> right? So yeah, they look cool. I'm just kind of wondering how they should all go together, right? Yeah. Oh, nice. But I do like those kits. There's a lot of bits on them, and they all fit together pretty well. Mm -hmm. Like, even mixing, like, the Stargrave and Frostgrave kits to get some interesting That's looking great. stuff. That's yeah, really impressive. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that shows a lot. That's a, there's a lot of good design going into those. Uh, yeah. yeah so that you you do, do have that. to do some work on some of the neck joints, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, everything fits together really well. Yeah. That's good. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about mm. this later. But uh, yeah, that was a thing, a, an interesting mistake, <laughs> or I guess a, a revelation that they had der, uh, for miniatures, uh, because they were always talking about the flexibility, especially in the '90s, the flexibility mm. of on a sprue, many, many options. So yep. every uh, character is unique. And Kill Team kind of st started people wanting to go back to that because like okay. the kill, kill Team sprue is like you have specialists and you want to put the little, right. you know, comms backpack yeah, on yeah, them yeah. or whatever, and. Uh, so people started thinking like that, but, you know, 40K started to move a lot towards monopose and even like push fit. Like, you, mm. know, you don't even need glue for some of these like starter sets. And uh, so we'll talk about a company yeah, that, yeah. that realized uh, we want a, you know, a customizable box and these are the reasons we're doing it. And, and they release one monopose figure with like a really dynamic pose and people are like, that's what we wanted oh. the whole time. Yeah. So we'll catch you up on that. Nice. <laughs> that was an, yeah, an interesting... And I think it was maybe part of the reason that they're like, okay, we gotta, we gotta right. rethink okay. things. Okay. 
All right. So yeah, and yeah, we should also pool our our resources, like the miniatures games that we're both like Ooh, looking yeah. at, and uh, kind of take a look at rule sets and things, and so we can decide like what we want to do next. All of it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, we want to. How am I that. supposed to choose the order that we play <laughs> things? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and thanks. Yeah, I, I, uh, the silver Yay. bayonet. Yeah, silver bayonet kits uh, are amazing. Yeah, oh, nice. They're really, yeah, they're really great. I like uh, same, you know, same uh, company, so same design. Uh, but the uh, metal minis are wonderful. Yeah, oh, nice. Got a, a lot of excellent detail and everything, and they, you know, feel so much more substantial. I have not done metal in a while. I kind of like, well, with mm. all the like kit bashing and stuff I'm doing, I'm kind of like. I don't really want metal. I don't want to sit there with like a saw. Like, <laughs> right. I just kind of want to like. There's an arm. There's an arm. There's an interesting hand, and done. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The um, uh, most of the metal stuff I did was the Ralpartha EU stuff, and uh, yeah, that that's gorgeous. Kind of like the too. old, kind of like chunky. Yeah. They, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. Yeah. They, they they don't look like there's no there's no digital sculpting. This is all like you know physical mm. like. A, uh, it still feels very 90s, and uh, but the detail is amazing. The sculpts, you know, have so much personality and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I've really been enjoying that. So that's very, yeah, very retro. Nice. But uh, all right, so we gotta, yeah, we gotta get these gangs on the, <laughs> yeah. on the battlefield here. I actually have two more sprues coming. <laughs> oh yeah. I gave in, and I'm like, all right, uh, an individual sprue of mercenaries and troopers. Oh. Just for different because there's so many arms mm, on that mm-hmm. thing and i'm like ah that's all light armor i want something that looks a little ah, heavier nice but, oh wow yeah. very cool wow yeah i can't yeah. wait to uh, shipping to japan is ridiculous yeah thing. yeah it was um yeah speaking of uh, his hysterical shipping <laughs> um, i think uh, uh i was talking to uh miguel online uh, who's in the chat a lot, and uh, he was looking at the Siege of the Citadel kind of clearance sale. Ooh, nice. So Modifius is like clearing mm. everything out from their UK shop. So they discounted the price pretty significantly, like 20 pounds. So the core set was like 120 pounds uh, for you know everything that's not all, no right. expansions, but everything that they originally offered. And the shipping was 119 Ooh, pounds. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so... It's like, uh, yeah, that is actually, you don't save anything. Yeah. The clearance price doesn't save you up. Yeah, I mean, it was like, I was doing like $5 a sprue and then like $5 shipping. I'm like, oh, all mm. right. I, I, okay, 20 bucks total for 20, mm. like 10 people, $2. Okay, that's. Yeah, yeah. But no, oh, <laughs> 100. Yeah, double. No. Yeah, because no. it's just all, it's so much cardboard. Yeah, yeah that, those, that, that board game is just so many tile sets and it's so many cards as well. So it's just. A block. It's a yeah. chunk of wood, and you just <laughs> made it. <laughs> and uh, so that was hysterical. That like that was the best they could do because usually the UK is a little bit better yeah, to yeah. Japan. I like it. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So and that's it. I mean, by the end of so end of June, Modifius is done with Mutant Chronicles. Oh wow. They're clearing oh. everything out, and they're just going to take it off the store. So. Wow. So we got to work on getting that license for the uh, fourth edition yes, yes. RPG. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So what? What rule set would we use oh. for Mutant Chronicles? Tabletop RPG? Yeah, yeah. If we do a tabletop. Well, right off the bat, just not fucking D20. <laughs> not t- about two D20s. <laughs> That's a little bit better because at least you get kind of like a, some math going on. Right, there. right. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I would maybe do something quick like D6 die pool or something. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been really liking that uh, in, in a lot of games. Uh, and, and that's the Cthulhu. Uh, mm. yeah, Cthulhu is all D6s as well. Yeah, something like that would be fun. And then it's a little bit more... I like that because then the Warzone and Mutant Chronicles, like I like when there's some similarity right. in like, what you're rolling and how it feels yeah. at yeah. the table. All right. Well, hello, everyone in chat. And uh, yeah, please... Uh, Bug us with comments and any questions. Well, Not that we'll see them. Going. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll mention them afterwards. After the cast. Yeah. yeah. And so that's uh, that's part of being a, a patron is you can listen to this uh, on the RSS feed, uh, and uh, also from the archive live stream. But hear everything that goes on kind of before and after the cast. So right. what goes on uh, for the podcast uh, regular RSS is a little a little more limited. So the interactive parts are the uh, kind of bonus content. Mm. All right. So let's get started cool. for this week. <clears throat> Welcome to the weekly. I'm Jeremy. I'm Chris. And this week on the weekly, Warzone Eternal canceled. Ooh. Goodman Games acquires Caverns of Thracia. Hmm. Embracer Group Preservation. <laughs> preservation. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, they're embracing even more things. Huh. And uh, Arkham Horror audiobooks. Oh. 
So let's start with the biggest news, kind of the, it was kind of a shock. Mm. Uh, this happened on the 27th and uh, just out of nowhere. Uh, there wasn't really any hint about this. Okay. And we had just seen a demo game of uh, the rule set. And so, okay, we're getting some idea. Right. We're getting a good picture of what this looks like. Okay, there's the miniatures. Okay. And then we get a message for all backers. So the message was, we're stepping back and reassessing. So hello, everyone. Um, uh, the... Uh, there, a third of the way into the campaign is a good time to take a look at what we've accomplished thus far and it looks and uh, and where it looks like things are headed. Mm. So the very first thing they said is they're not looking particularly smooth. Mm. But we feel like the campaign's nearly stalled completely. So they talk about the, the kind of curve of yep. it. There's yep. a immediate hype and then a lull yep. and then towards the end it picks up yep. and they just kind of flatlined. And so we're worried that everyone that was interested in it was committed and there wasn't any new attention or new energy hmm. that was coming back interesting i'll, I'll okay i'll let you continue mm -hmm. oh with sure the, with the message but yeah and uh so it was abundantly clear that they miscalculated and they're looking uh, uh looking for a better way to handle kind of the relaunch of Warzone. so uh a few of the things that they mentioned um so that that uh they were really looking for a, the uh, long, reliable tail end funding bump is right. what, okay. what they were calling it, mm -hmm. and afraid that it wasn't going to happen okay. just because the there's some negativity going on in some parts about the miniatures, and uh, it didn't seem like uh, they were really reaching everybody that would be interested in the game. So they discussed it with the uh, licensor, Heroic Signatures, and... Um, they said, learned a lot from the first 10 days, but uh, they're either going to do a revised relaunch Kickstarter mm -hmm. or some other way to bring right. the game to funding. Okay. Which, but, I guess, important question. Mm -hmm. They had funded. Yes, in the first day, 24 right. hours. So it's not, it's not as if Warzone said, we haven't made it. We're probably not going to make it. Let's right. reassess. It's like, we funded. We were hoping for more and probably not going to get it. Mm -hmm. Or feel like we're not going to get it right. Yeah, and and really, I think the the motivation was they wanted this to be able to fund them into retail. So not only did they want to pay for everything of the initial launch, but the beginning of the next wave. Right, so because right. they had to kind of get a start on that for retail, so be able to pay the sculptors and everybody to get things going, so um, they could box up everything. And and they even said on the site that the boxes you were going to be receiving are not retail boxes; they're right, just going right. to be plain graphics right. and you know with the miniatures in them. So they needed that funding to produce graphics for the boxes and to get everything going for the next set. Of, so they uh, were actually going to use the Kickstarter to kickstart right. stuff. Yes, right? that, yeah, isn't yeah. that a weird thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, and they said, yeah, of course, so that obviously meant that the goal that they set was lower than they actually needed to complete the project in their perfect, you know, perfect yep, terms. Yep. Like they could have fulfilled what they, uh, what they promised with that level, but it also probably wouldn't have been as quickly. They wouldn't have been able to do yep. it as, as, as uh, quickly because the way that they decided to do the boxes of miniatures, and that's one thing that uh, came up. So uh, they addressed specifically not only the war zone curse, which mm -hmm. does not exist, <laughs> and uh, and kind of the the um, kind of listening to the passionate fan mm -hmm. base and trying to gauge what people were saying. And a few of the things that they said were things like the unit boxes were very expensive. I think right. fifty dollars okay. for five. That's that's a lot, right? But uh, the what they we're trying to do is give you two types of units in one box and a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant is that you had torsos, like legs and torsos, and then you know customizable heads, uh, shoulder pads, and arms. You know, holding different weapons, yep. combinations of weapons, and that gave you a lot of flexibility about what you could make from that box. But they weren't very dynamic miniatures. They had a, a retro, more generic kind of '90s feel to them. Which th it seemed to be straddling I'm, that that hmm. you know the look of the old metal, right. metal heartbreaker miniatures, a newer digital design, but also the flexibility of doing it in pieces, meant that they they weren't quite serving anybody right. perfectly. Right, right. And what happened is they weren't doing stretch goals, but they were doing kind of I forget what they were calling them kind of updates. They were. Um, Unlocks, yeah. So okay. they were they were doing unlocks. So as things progressed, they were offering more. And one of the things that they offered was Mortificator Crenshaw in this very dynamic, very beautiful monopose. No, you know, no mm. uh, customizing 
customizable miniature and people said that's what we want this right, is it okay. this is it because uh, that's what uh, chronopia went with you know they were all yeah, yeah, monopos yeah. very dynamic monopos and multiple sculpts for the, the, the same units, units right yeah. so you don't have a unit of five spearmen I, yeah, that are exactly yeah. identical yeah, yeah. <laughs> right right so they give you a nice variety of uh, sculpts so then uh, that kind of I probably reinforce the fact. Okay, I think we're a little wrong-headed because yeah, people got very excited about. Or not even wrong-headed, but like okay, we we didn't anticipate this mm. is what people would want. Mm -hmm. It it is, and yeah. okay, so let's go back and rethink. Like okay, fifty dollars for five miniatures is a lot, and I'm sure I don't know how these miniatures were being produced. Maybe it was going to be like CO cast. Yes, right. Okay, so it was CO cast, but of course I'm sure this company is not as big as some of the others but right. we were just talking about like the frost grave and stargrave oh, right. miniatures mm -hmm. before and okay a box of 20 miniatures is 20 pounds 20 22 ish pounds for the larger things like gnolls and mm -hmm. lizard men but one sprue is five generally five bodies a bunch of heads a bunch of weapons right and okay it's torso and legs together mm -hmm. but even on the the secondary market a single sprue goes for about five or six pounds. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what was on those those war zone sprues because, mm -hmm. like, there are multiple options to get enough right. on those frostgrave sprues. If they had done something similar, mm. that seems to me like a decent variety. Not for fifty bucks, right? right? Yeah, and it was, um, you know, basically trying to put two kits in one, but letting you only build five one. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of the one. You know, maybe have to make a choice. But that sounds like it could go on a single sprue. Yeah, right. It could. But they, they were saying, though, they did give a pretty huge variety of options, though, because there were five heads. You know, there, there were yep. five heads for each. So you got ten heads. Yeah, ten heads. Then, ten arm sets. Right, right. And so the only thing that was uh, five of was the, the torso legs. And so that they said about 40 plus components for each unit hmm. box. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of stuff in there, and it's not on a sprue because it's produced with seal cast. Right, so it's, you know, okay. Basically, it's, everything is, you know, loose, like you would get yep. resin or... Um, uh, so, yeah, and it was just, I guess it was hard to to show people the, you know, the, the sense of that. And they're also saying that, you know, in retail, they're going to be competing for shelf space. Yep, and if yep. they can combine things, if they can say this is this slash this, yep, yep. then they're not, com you know, demanding so much shelf space from hobby shops and maybe doing better. I remember back in the day when... Uh Lyle and I had just started playing War no, 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 War Machine. Mm -hmm. And even in the lore of the War Machine, it's like, okay, this War Jack is built from the chassis of that War Jack just with a different option. And that's when, when uh, Privateer Press was doing metal miniatures. Oh, and yeah, we're yeah. like, there's no, like I even said, there's no way these three War Jacks that all use the same body mm -hmm. couldn't be the same fucking plastic kit. And then five or six years later, <laughs> here it is. Yes. It's like you buy this and you get the th different arm sets, the right. different unit cards. You're building one of them. And I said, fuck you. I'm going to magnetize them. <laughs> right. Yes, and and I'm going to get all of them yes. from that kit. And then I sold all my stuff off. But like <laughs> I understand the desire to say this one kit mm -hmm. builds you A or B mm -hmm. or even C sometimes. Like even GW is doing that. Oh, now. yeah. Yeah. Like their big giant tyrannid monsters are like this is whatever, a Venom Thrope or like the Zone Thrope, right? Right. And of course, GW is perfectly expensive. I never buy any of this <laughs> stuff again. But like, I get why you would do that, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so it, it was uh, it was a little frustrating, and they didn't. Uh, they did release kind of a um, a summary. You got to look at the rules, not the full rules, and, oh, okay. and no no stat lines for miniatures. So you could actually do. There was no way to demo play anything because right. you didn't have anybody's stats. Um, but so they needed to do a little bit of that. I really liked how Chronopia did mm -hmm. that. They just got demo kits out to everybody and we played the game you know we, we played it with a, a very small amount of miniatures and saw that so you're not just going to be trying to kill each other there's going to be mm -hmm. you know objectives you're going to be killing witnesses <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. be, it will be it'll be a very very rough uh, interrogation yeah i'm a little bit surprised that the the warzone kickstarter didn't put out a play test or print and play mm -hmm. book and like okay i have never run a kickstarter i probably will never run a kickstarter i hate discord i'm in a couple of them for mm -hmm. the smaller skirmish games and it seems like recently kind of across the board mm -hmm. there have been or there has been like a major or substantial influx of new people because it's always like so and so has joined so and so has uh, joined so and so uh -huh. so has joined 
And that's for th like uh, Brawl Arcane 28, Necropolis 28, Turn Up. And the thing that those little indie games all have in common, mm -hmm. the rules are available for free. Ah, yes, uh, here, yes. Here's a PDF, right? right? You can play with whatever miniatures you want, convert your stuff, but the rules are free. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if doing something similar mm. encourages people to say, you know what? I got the rules. They seem decent. I could play with whatever, but let's yeah. get the official miniatures, right? Right, right. Yeah, so, mm, yeah, because they're going to do stat cards in the boxes. So I don't even think in the rule book there were going to be stat lines. And the, mm. other th the other thing, too, that was kind of a, a little bit of a, okay, you need to commit a little bit more to this project is they were doing a booklet, a soft cover, like maybe A5 mm -hmm. uh, rule book. Not a big chunky hardcover, you know. That I actually don't <coughs> mind because yeah. portability. Oh, that's I true. love yeah, portability. Yeah. Right, so right, if right. you got like this one of these big like tomes, I'm like, oh geez. Like, so, uh, however perceived value, right? Right. right. A nice fancy and deluxe have... hardback looks nice and has perceived value. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So they could yeah it could have done a more you know uh, kind of premium set or whatever. But I guess you know. In this age of yeah, things being production being so expensive, paper mm. shortages, and you know supply chain, it was probably a smart move to to stick you know just, A5 yeah to stay cover, yeah, yeah stay small and light. But that was one thing. If you just wanted the rules, they weren't even going to get that much from you for just the rules because it was just a soft cover book. Right. So uh, yeah, I don't know, but it's coming back. I mean, okay. in in some form, some they're, form. they're promising they're they're retooling, and we'll see what's going on. And I hope them all the best. Uh, talking to Alex, he was a genuinely passionate about this property. Was like very happy to actually have the opportunity mm. to work with uh, uh, work with a licensor and and be producing an actual licensed war zone instead of a, a you know a, a yeah spiritual uh, right <laughs> um, the uh, inspiration uh, what the what is the phrase they're always using the spiritual successor successor yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right right it would be war ground or something like <laughs> right, that? Yeah, yes yeah. yeah and uh, battle uh, zone <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Brian Steele who worked on Dark Age I think for Kumini or okay. maybe come on. Um, which was the spiritual successor mm. of Warzone because of a very similar rule set. So he wrote and kind of managed that project. So he was a good choice for this new, um, this new Warzone Eternal. And we're just not going to get to see it now. For and we've already been, well, we've already been like, you know, it's been maybe two years of people going, oh, give us something, give us something, well, and we, we finally got it. But we might see it because mm. there's no indication that they're going to completely revamp. The rules. Oh no! Yeah, I think the, the rules. The rules are are here to stay. Okay. I think the, yeah, the rules. The rule set are what they are. I think it's mostly the miniatures and how they're going to promote uh, the game itself, right. or or structure kind of the right, right campaign. Yeah, and it wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, we've we're already looking at there are people doing amazing things. I mean, you might not be happy about the fees for it or whatever, mm -hmm. but amazing things on Patreon. And if you could do. This month we're releasing this unit. This mm -hmm. month we're releasing this unit, and if we're gonna do kits, so you can, it can be any corp you want. You know, you can you can um, uh, for basic infantry right. and things you can swap uh, swap corps and stuff. They could get a huge subscriber base that was constantly giving them an influx of revenue to keep paying sculptors, to keep paying yep. you know to to develop this game. If if the licensor would go for something like that, that's well, a, a thing. Because no, a, I forgot. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. dealing with the licensor. So maybe this may have been the licensor going. You're not bringing in enough. Mm. We gotta shut it down. Right, right. But I was also thinking like STLs, right? Like you said, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, sure. Like, y you wouldn't have to do them for free for some kind of like low cost thing. Like again, like STLs are great. There's still a demand for physical miniatures, yes, right. right? So I don't think you'd be eating into your market that much, right. and you would allow people to play a lot faster, right? right. Which would maybe build up the hype for other people to join on. Like, and what is that? Yeah, oh, yeah. cool. A, a community. Yeah, definitely. And and because there are so many people, if you offer, you know, some sort of retail level where they're paying you a lot of money uh, to be able to sell physical mm. versions of that, you could have reliable people that have already, they've got professional, you know, 3D Printing printers and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and they're uh, doing really high quality uh, models. Yeah, so I think that that model for war games is looking better and better mm. as far as and and then the rule set can be a little bit more dynamic. It, you know, you can uh, you know add things, add mechanics, and kind of you know go with what the uh, uh, community is interested in doing. And uh, so, yeah, maybe not trying to do a full retail release. The the kind of presence that you know you would want in the '90s and that you'd want to do at conventions in the '90s. You know, can you imagine though bringing physical boxes of you know of mm. nice, you know, amazingly printed uh, models? And I guess you know they could still be CO cast as well. They yep. could still like work directly with the the CO cast. 
um, manufacturer to uh, uh, do that. I mean, there's, there's definitely alternatives that I think would give you direct connection to the fan base, would save you so much from you know, shipping and distributing yep. and, you know, having to design packages to just sit on shelves and collect dust and get thrown in a clearance bin and all yeah, that yeah. great stuff. I'm quite a fan of the um, Black Sight Studio, just black envelope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, it's just like a black envelope <laughs> with a sticker on the front. Mm-hmm. It saves on packaging and it doesn't take up a lot of space. And you're just like, okay, that looks pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, so I guess it would just depend on yeah what the what the licensor is you yeah. know like no no we we were expecting a yeah. retail release yeah. we we're expecting a product you know that would be uh, of a certain quality that wasn't going to be a a hobby kind of do it yourself mm. you know kind of a community so that's that's too bad and we'll see so yeah we've gone on a lot but yeah, I, we have. I have a lot a lot of <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of, a lot of uh, sad sadness uh, related to this this was, this was kind of the wake <laughs> for <laughs> the the first attempt at uh, Warzone. But yeah, so we'll we'll see what happens, and I, I hope they communicate more and uh, let us know what's going on, hmm. and not be afraid of criticism, because that's going to help them. If they would have heard more criticism early on, maybe they would have right. kind of structured things differently. Right. We'll see. Well, good luck, Resnova, and uh, we we'll hope to see you back again soon. Uh, speaking of a game company that uh, um, is in the middle of releasing things uh, pretty, pretty relentlessly. Uh, Goodman games announced that um, they are, they currently have a Kickstarter for dark tower. Okay. And now they just announced that caverns of Thracia is going to be released for five E and dungeon crawl classics. Huh. So that's the thing that they've started to move toward. They did all of the old D and D kind of basic, uh, basic and expert modules for five E. So they reproduced the original books in this like hardcover okay. volume, and then did a uh, they ported everything to five E. But now they've realized, well, we want to take this old stuff and also use it for our for right. our, our game. So Dungeon Crawl Classics is uh, now they're they're doing it kind of for both, and so it's a five E or Dungeon Crawl right. Classics kind of volume, and that's what Dark Tower is currently on Kickstarter. And Dark Tower was written by Janelle Jaquez, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, for the Judges Guild okay. originally, and so was uh, Caverns of Thracia. Right. So this is the second work uh, by this creator. Both published by Judges Guild, and Judges Guild has had a little bit of a bump mm, in their yep. <laughs> in their kind of reputation. So it's good that the kind of classic things are, are being reprinted by other companies that have maintained their uh, their cred Standing in, <laughs> in, credit. The, yeah, in yeah. the market. But uh, yeah, so a beloved adventure module, uh, and the Caverns of Thracia is for uh, levels two to six, and the five E conversion will. will approximate that where the dungeon Corp classics will just make it you know, higher level right. characters and uh, of course this is steeped in greek mythology oh, you can yeah, tell yeah. by the the name so an intricate dungeon and a lost city with uh that was once a haven of lizard folk so you gotta love the lizard folk so it's all lizard folk in togas and sandals <laughs> right yeah, yes yes right. and throw in some evil cultists okay. uh, for good measure also in togas and sandals <laughs> <laughs> yes but uh the um uh, the thing that t- they talk about with this designer specifically is um, uh, their use of factions and flexibility in running very complex adventures. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, the term of uh, jacquaying a uh, dungeon comes from that the, wow, the way nice. that uh, this yeah, kind of complicated uh, uh, adventures are run. And uh, also, the, there's, so there's kind of historical background here mm-hmm. being based in uh, uh, the uh, Greek mythology. Uh, they'll be, yeah, so you'll be able to uh, kind of appreciate the inspiration for this. And so the designer said, uh, my designs uh, for Caverns of Thracia were born from the union of several themes, the three-dimensional nature of large cavern spaces, ancient Greek architecture, and a faction of beast men united together. Uh, much of that uh, can be seen on the cover art and that, uh, that I originally created for the adventure. Hmm. So yeah, it's uh, originally pr- uh, produced in 1979 uh, oh. through Judges Guild. So just like their their previous books, the Good Goodman Games books, it's going to be high quality scans, probably better than what you can get the for print on demand, right. even from drive through, um, of, of a nice hardback volume, and either for Dungeon Crawl Classics or Five E. I wonder it, it might be a scan. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's not, but they would have to update stuff or change stuff for Five E, right? So I wonder right, if right. it's if they have like. Maybe not the layout files, but if this has been transcribed into modern layout files. Yeah, yeah po- possibly. I think they would they would have to. But but the original the uh, original books do look very archival. They hmm. look like very like like just high resolution scans that are reproduced. But then they do in the same similar look and layout the uh, updated nice. or you know ported materials. Hmm. They have a similar look, but I really like that about the the classic. Uh, D and D books, as you have the, and it's usually a very large. The volumes are they're bigger than A four. They're like a really oh, wow. substantial, like hardcover book, and uh, they have a, 
really nice reprodu reproductions of all the maps and everything in the same color and everything that you would get uh, in the original module. So yeah, Goodman Games does a good job of that. So if you have any experience with it or uh, would like to play it for a different rule set, uh, yeah, keep an eye out for that. It's coming out, I believe, oh, next it's a, a year. Kickstarter. It's probably, probably go to Kickstarter just like uh, Dark Tower did. So oh. Dark Tower is finishing up currently. And yeah, this will be release date targeted sometime next year. Cool. Yeah, so more goodness from Goodman Games. And so not so goodness. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to think about this. Is I'm nothing but suspicious about this. And I, I wish I had my tentacles oh, yeah. uh, you know, gift to play right now, the little animated tentacles. But the Embracer Group is now collecting historical games in addition to developers. <laughs> so that's the headline. So recently they just purchased a bunch of kind of classic uh, developers that have properties that need need rebooted. Okay. And they're also collecting physical games. So they're, they're preserving. They're, they're working in this way to preserve. And I, I'm not quite sure. Okay, when, you say, when you say like <laughs> collecting games, does it mean like, Visi so, like we now own this IP or this property? Well, the, or we're like, studios, we'll buy all these yeah, old games. With the studio, right. Well, it's, it's a weird combination. So all with right. the studios that they're acquiring, mm -hmm. they own the properties. Right. With this preservation movement, it's just a shelf full of cartridges. <laughs> oh, in video game form. Yes. yes. Well, so it's very, don't give them any ideas because yeah. I'm sure they're going to move on to tabletop games as well. But uh, yeah, so currently they uh, have an archive of over 50,000 um, yeah, 50, games, consoles, and accessories in their Karlstad, uh, Sweden uh, headquarters. Well, okay. I'm not, I'm not a video game person. <laughs> right. So a lot of the video game stuff kind of goes over my head or, mm -hmm. or isn't necessarily of interest to me. One area that is kind of of interest to me, though I am not involved in it at all, is like di digitally archiving stuff, right? Right. And just seeing people on social media saying, okay, like CDs are kind of, some CDs are kind of reaching the end of their shelf life or like these old NES cartridges, right, are kind of, I think they call it what, like bit rot, right? right. Mm -hmm. Like things are, and with all the Warner Brothers and media companies moving to streaming and hearing how like film mm -hmm, is just mm -hmm. deteriorating and where we've lost all these movies. Okay, I'm suspicious as well because it's the Embracer <laughs> Group and they seem right. kind of, yes. with a name like Embracer <laughs> Group, you can't not be ominous, right? But maybe they just said someone really should mm. collect and preserve and archive this stuff just for kind of, posterity's sake right to kind of just to have it mm -hmm. so people can look at and i don't know what they're going to do with it hopefully nothing just, hopefully yeah, right. hopefully just to like <laughs> collect and archive and right. preserve yes yes just so that these things are kept mm. right? yeah so the uh this preservationist archive has a ceo an archivist an assistant a technical engineer and a supply manager hmm. so there's an actual team okay. but this is not Unusual. Any large video game studio, like the big AAA studios, they have this. They have a library where you say, oh, I want to play Street Fighter Alpha. And then you go and you say, well, what format do you want? Because they have a giant room that is an archive of every game. And, and as, That they've uh, made, though? Yeah, no, no, not that they've made, just that they've collected. Because uh. you want to be able to, to play right. stuff to be like, okay, so we want it to be like this. Right. Do you remember that? Let's play that and see what it's like. So they already do that because you know most of the designers are, are already hobbyists and if the company is going to pay for you to you know go to japan and pay 200 dollars yeah, for, for a cartridge for, yeah, for yeah. a cartridge then you know you can do that and and build a pretty impressive library so those things already exist you know of course the games that they've published but also stuff for research so there are research archives in game studios so maybe they're just cre i don't know you have to travel to sweden though to you do yeah. like just a thought okay no idea whether this is public mm -hmm. right it might not be, but if they're if they're snapping up all these studios, mm -hmm. okay, with physical games you'd have to like ship them or something or or send someone there. But this might just be them collecting a giant library for all their studios to have access mm, to. Maybe I yeah, mean that, could, that seems yeah. kind of logistically difficult to get people there to play it. Right. But uh, but it could be know. yeah yeah it could be that that and they'll just like you know airmail you the yep. uh, yeah or they're anticipating some kind of like huge digital <laughs> crash in the future and be like we own all your games belong to us now we're the only people who have games I don't know and unfortunately it's the PAL versions of everything so uh, yeah I don't have anything to play them on uh, but yeah currently the collection is not accessible by, by public or researchers but they stated that they want to build a database and start to make it 
more available. Hmm. So who knows? And this this follows the news of, uh, of course, uh, Embracer Group embracing a further collection of Crystal Dynamics, uh, EDOS uh, Montreal, as well as uh, yeah, Crystal Dynamics, and uh, Square Enix Montreal. Hmm. So that gives them Tomb Raider, uh, Deus Ex, uh, Thief, and Legacy of Cain as new IPs. So... They just keep collecting, yep, they do. Yep. <laughs> collecting personnel, office space, and cartridges. Yep. <laughs> so there we go. So expect to see Deus Ex or uh, Tomb Raider rebooted uh, sometimes. That's a crossover. Uh, yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cyberpunk uh, Laura Croft. Wow, come on. Laura Croft was, I mean, okay, I played one Laura Croft game. That was not on the <laughs> PS1, and I kept dying, like, immediately in the one I played. I didn't even get up to, like, the fucking dinosaurs or anything like that. But I remember she just fought... Everything, mm -hmm. didn't she? So yep, yep. cyberpunk, yeah, it fits, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> there's, there's no ambiguity here. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. kill those cyber wolves and cyber bears. Yeah. yeah. Man, the only Laura Croft I played is when she had the pointy boob. Oh, right, right, <laughs> like, yeah, where it was just, yeah, there weren't enough polygons. There weren't enough polygons, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't even see it because all you did is start her back the whole time. Oh, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, so uh, we'll continue to update you on the how Embracer is uh, creeping into your life and probably claiming you know beloved things that you hope. Uh, this is ours. Now. <laughs> yes. So hopefully this is all leading to some sort of corporate synergy that means we're going to oh, see geez. whatever comic books and whatever yeah. all coming out. Yeah, hopefully. But uh, another kind of synergy that we're seeing now, um, so a little bit of cooperation between a couple of companies is bringing us Arkham Horror radio drama ooh, style ooh. audiobooks. Yeah. Radio drama. Now I'm interested. Yeah. So um, Acolyte Games uh, is working with Asmodee and all the stuff that they own uh, in a partnership with Graphic Audio. So Graphic Audio produces fully dram dramatized, dramatized uh -huh. <laughs> like fully cast actors, sound effects scored um uh, audio versions hmm. of books. And so there's a um, already a series of novels uh, done for the Arkham Horror. So Arkham Horror is, I guess originally it was uh, fantasy. Is Arkham it Horror was the, Fantasy yeah, Flight. Were, I had the old Fantasy yeah. Flight board games, yeah. Right, so it, it's it's not Lovecraft text. It's their characters and like their investigators and their um, version Yeah, but of there that. were definitely love characters from the H.P. Lovecraft series in there. Like, oh. some of the NPCs you could run into, I distinctly remember you, Pikmin. Really? Not the painter Pikmin. Like, because I think oh, maybe it was public, it oh, probably was public domain yeah, then. Right. It was just like, or they worked through some kind of foundation where it's like, okay, individual new investigators, you are definitely playing in the H.P. Lovecraft mythos. Oh. And here are some yeah, places character. and stuff you could go. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, that means uh, five books, five Arkham Horror books will, uh, are being produced. The first is already out. I think the first two are already hmm. out. Uh, Wrath of Nikkei, uh, Nikkei by Josh Reynolds and one more, which I don't have huh. uh, listed here. Um, and they're also, so that there'll be five in total uh, that will be kind of uh, produced on a irregularly monthly basis because they're also doing... Three Twilight Imperium novels oh. and three Zombicide books. So that's a combination of a couple of different companies <laughs> mm. owning different rights. So I, I have no idea um, the combination of things. I took a look at the website and was a little a little shocked by the uh, price. The prices are a little dear. Um, twenty ninety nine for uh, an audiobook, but. Comparing that to kind of like Audible or what's out there, it's, that's comparable because it's, comparable, it's eight yeah. and a half hours okay. of audio. And this is, you know, fully cast. Yep. It's not a single person in a studio with Yeah, that's that's I mean, I, I would balk at the, I would balk at that price as well, but it is comparable to other yes. audio books. Right. Say, yeah. So there's yeah, so the digital uh, uh, digital formats uh, of the uh, audio. So uh, Acolyte I'm sorry, <laughs> not Acolyte. Um Aconite, 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 uh, A C O N Y T E, Aconite. yes, Aconite. was founded in 2020. Um, and they are, uh, are working to expand uh, some of Asmodee's properties. So they're expecting uh, not all Ar Arkham Horror, but about two to three books every month to be released with these different properties. Oh. And uh, Ken Jackson, who's the creative director at Graphic Audio, uh, who's actually doing the production, said, As a young reader, I devoured mysteries, particularly Agatha Christie. It's no wonder that I've been drawn to the Arkham Horror. Uh, it is a, uh, specifically the, uh, the Wrath of Nakai. Uh, it's a story of international thief of, exo es of esoteric artifacts who stumbles onto a nightmarish cult in 1920s New England. Ain't that always Surprise. the way, though? Gosh <laughs> darn it. <laughs> yes. 
So, uh, uh, yeah, and, and they have a sample on the website. And so the quality of the, the acting and everything is great. And it ha really has like a 1920s tone. I was going to yeah, say, I would yeah. want to listen to this if it kind of had that crackly radio oh, yeah. tone. <laughs> yeah, that would be like, great. Not to the point of being annoying, but mm -hmm. to the point of kind of helping to set the time period. Right. Right. Yeah, the, uh, the voice actors are definitely doing that. They're, nice. de they're definitely, yeah, uh, speaking as 1920s as they can. So it doesn't sound it doesn't sound modern or have any strange, uh, there's no vocal fry or anything mm. in, the, uh, in the performances. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so I'll leave a link uh, in this description so you can check those out as oh, well. Cool. So it's some, yeah, some interesting properties that they're working with and it's... Uh, they're doing these are really full scale productions, so they can't be cheap to do this. No, so, they can't. Yeah. Which is why I'm like I'm by no means saying that price is unreasonable. Right. right. And actually, there's a special going on now, so they're uh, uh, marked down to fourteen sixty nine nice. for some of the newer stuff. And this is uh, this is a lot of uh, a lot of content, so eight point five hours. Oh, cool. And who knows? Um, I think they're they're keeping them on their site for right now, but yeah, who knows what they're going to do for distribution because. They probably want to get as much of that, <laughs> as much of that price as possible, and not share with companies like Amazon. Right. But right. yeah, uh, so that, that's worth checking out. I was really surprised uh, that it's getting that much attention because nice. I knew they continued to produce the stories, but I didn't know yeah where else they were going. Hmm. Cool. All right. So that'll do it for this week. Yeah. So where can people find you? Uh, on Twitter, as always. That's Hive Mind H Y V E M Y N D. Uh, Instagram as well, where I just post a lot of unpainted frost grave and star grave <laughs> miniatures that little light box yes really makes things look oh, a lot cool. better now you don't have like the background with like my tv and like, my kid <laughs> trying to, like stick your hand in the it's like nice black no. background where right. everything is deep nice and crisp oh, oh good yeah. yep. so how about you and i'm still doing my uh, single panel gag cartoon so uh, monday nights in north america i do a live stream where i draw the two cartoons for every week so that's abuse cartoons on youtube and twitch and on all, all social media abuse cartoons and if you want to check out the cartoon go to gocomics.com slash domestic abuse and if you want to support what we're doing here oh in fact let me oh, yeah, yeah. let me say uh thank you to our newest oh i can't even see our newest uh, patron, uh, Demiel. Thank you. And here's your Ooh. fiery welcome. <laughs> we are now immolated. <laughs> Is that what our patrons wanted? Yes, that's okay. what they want to see. Uh, so I think from the email address, I'm, I'm guessing uh, Netherlands. Okay. Um, so yeah, a, a, a European patron. And Yay. thank you so much for uh, uh, supporting us. And, and keep in touch uh, through Patreon to let us know uh, what you'd like to see more of and what we're doing. More fiery explosions. And, yes, New goal. <laughs> yes, more fire. Supporter on every continent. <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> we're getting there. We're oh, getting nice. there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so thanks so much. And uh, so for all uh, patrons and also YouTube uh, members, so the join button below this video. Uh, Somewhere down there. <laughs> if you're listening to a podcast, there is no join <laughs> button. But uh, if you're watching this uh, as video, the uh, join button will let you be a, a YouTube member, which will give you access to a lot of the um, same things as the uh, the patrons, and so those are two ways that you can help support what we're doing and hear, uh, e yeah, everything that we're up to. And so uh, before and after this podcast, uh, this goes onto the uh, the uh, Patreon uh, RSS feed, so all of the patrons can hear the the kind of preamble and discussion post. <laughs> and post discussion and uh, kind of uh, answering questions in the chat and kind of interacting. So if you like the interactive part of this, uh, consider becoming a patron. And the weakling pledge yes. <laughs> level Become is... Become a weakling. The, the patron level is uh, the strongest of them all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, uh, upturntable.com is the website and upturntable on all social media for all of that. So that'll do it for this week. Yeah. We'll be back next week. Later, mortals. Goodbye. Sweet. All right. And a special treat for everyone that's hanging around Ooh, for yeah. the uh, the live stream. A new uh, Kokoro no Me track. Uh, so as Chris leaves, yeah. So this is uh, Izumi, the new uh, video from Kokoro no Me.
All right. So I thought that would be a fun, uh, <laughs> a fun thing to, to throw in during that, uh, that little pause we got to take while Chris heads out. So I'll take a look at the chat. So, hey, Alvaro and Crispin, how's it going? Ah, uh, yes, you're here to commiserate <laughs> for the, uh, yeah, so we, we went on a bit about that, but the uh, the Kickstarter cancellation, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty sad that they uh, uh, yeah, didn't, didn't want to go through with it. I guess, you know, they wanted the, a certain kind of execution, but they should have been a little bit more open and communicate with people. I mean, they know they had a, a popular IP, and I just think, uh, yeah, people, I don't know, just uh, uh, it, it didn't catch on. It, and it did It did well. I mean, it, it had a bigger uh, a, a bigger uh, first uh, 24 hours than Chronopia did, but Chronopia was very solidly uh, uh, promoted. Like it kept, uh, and they did a lot to kind of keep changing the uh, the web page to, to, you know, the the page for the Kickstarter, sorry, the campaign page to let people know, which they did also do on Warzone, but it felt like, uh, yeah, too little, too late, which I think they even addressed in the uh, the message. They just said, uh, yeah, they didn't do uh, what they wanted to do. They didn't have the effect they were hoping to have. But, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I backed as well and was uh, disappointed that, uh, yeah, they canceled everything so uh uh oh so uh, chrisman was saying yeah the uh, um didn't mind the modu uh, modular minis they just didn't like the style yeah so the sculpts i think they were trying to yeah kind of compromise between a, a new new and old and that's never easy because i think uh people's tastes have changed a lot you know in miniature since the 90s because we've seen so many amazing digital sculpts and everything even for board games there's amazing miniatures now so you really have to be impressive i think uh with what you're delivering for that and Alvaro said yeah uh far from perfect as far as the uh the minis i wasn't convinced at the beginning that this kicks uh that the kickstarter but after the mortificator i managed to convince a couple of my friends to pledge oh nice a warzone level the same day that they canceled ah oh, man that sucks yeah, it, that's really funny because they did the demo game. There was all this promotion, and uh, Brian was doing all these videos on his channel, you know, talking about the rule set and the corporation, the mega corporations, and everything. So doing so much work for it, and then just yeah, just stopped. But I guess you know before it got before it got too far. I mean, if they would have like canceled in the final week, I think that would have been uh, that would have killed people's uh, motivation, uh, you know, even more. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, I was uh, I was really torn too with uh, both Chronopia and uh, uh, the uh, Warzone coming out in the same first half of the first of this year. I was uh, yeah torn about how much, but I can go I can go all in now <laughs> with my Chronopia pledge. So I will have a gigantic dwarven force. Uh, yeah. So we'll see. Uh, Ah, Christmas gonna buy another resin printer. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's definitely some comparable stuff out there. Ah, and a lot of Protus minis. Yeah, that makes sense. And and that's yeah, that's a difficult thing. I think coming off of if people first came to Warzone with Warzone Resurrection, then their expectation about what this is gonna look like and how it's gonna feel was a was different. I think from a kind of more retro style, uh, you know, re reboot of the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and that's, I guess that's the expectation too, is they, you know, you have to be within people's budgets and with the boxes, with the, the five, five uh, miniature uh, unit boxes being so expensive, I think that was pricing people out and not really having, when you went all in on that uh, campaign, it really didn't feel like you were getting much of a discount. You were just getting it, you know, before retail. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So a Patreon, I, I really think that if the licensor would agree to that, uh, a Patreon where you would just you would have this like constant income. So of course a Kickstarter, you know, you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars or you know whatever for um, to get things launched. But a Patreon, I mean, there are so many uh, Patreons for uh, uh, miniatures now and games, the one page rules and everything 
that they have these huge monthly uh, this huge monthly income that they can if you budget that well and the way Res, uh, Resnova is doing things where they're using all contractors there's nobody in house they could really uh, I think take advantage of that model and just kind of move in new ways but yeah that would be pretty cool because they could work with the people that are or they could just work with who they're who they're planning on working with uh, for Seocast and just do a web shop to order the miniatures. Uh, directly from them, and the SEOcast is going to, you know, be the best option for anybody that wants to uh, uh, get into the game but doesn't want to, you know, get into the whole printing aspect if they don't already have a, a printer set up. But yeah, they were kind of back and forth on that. When I was talking to to Alex, I think they were uh, torn, you know, about that because you want to the minis, the miniatures are what's going to fund the whole game and the whole community, and like you know, then things uh, at conventions they can do uh, tournaments and things. So they need that that income from the miniatures, but yeah, that that really big solid, uh, you know, monthly uh, influx of cash from a Patreon would be really a nice way to go. But like we were talking about during the main uh, podcast discussion, the licensor may just not. They're like, no, this was for a retail release of Warzone. We're not gonna, you know, do this uh, indefinite. Because that would be the that would be a heartbreaker too, though, is if you had a Patreon and you had like you know twenty thousand dollars or whatever coming in monthly that was funding an amazing version of Warzone, and then the then you know something happened to the license and that just had to suddenly stop. That would be that'd be a heartbreaker. No pun intended. So Dante, hey Dante, how's it going? I saw this on Kickstarter for Mutant Chronicles and uh, was heartbroken, but I was happy that they will put more focus and love into the game. And seems like they want to do cheaper models. Yeah, and I think with Seocast, they have some uh, flexibility to uh, uh, produce some good stuff. So we will see. Gaming Personal Museum. <laughs> yes, Embracer's become an eccentric type of villain now. Yes, Alvaro, you are correct. Yeah, the uh, Embracer group is just getting... Uh, pretty soon they're going to have... Hey, K5, how's it going? Good to see you. <laughs> Six months. Thank you for your support. That's great. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, it, they're pretty soon they're gonna have a, a swimming pool with sharks and lasers and all sorts of things at the uh, Embracer headquarters. <laughs> and Avar was saying, tried an Arkham Horror novel or novel uh, the book uh, too pulpy and too many cliches for me. Uh, yeah, so the yeah, good for a tone of the board game, but not so much for the novels. And, and I've heard that too. I've heard that they're kind of hit or miss. It, it kind of depends on the the author. And if they are going for too much over the top, kind of pulpy twenties, I mean, you can't beat Lovecraft. That's the thing with all these, you know, the the pastiche novels of Conan and uh, the uh, uh, Lovecraft works, the all the Cthulhu and, and Arkham stuff is the original writers were so good <laughs> that, you know, your attempt to either copy a style or make it your own is just always disappointing because, you know, uh, Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft were amazing pulp writers and you, you, their, their, you know, language and uh, imagery especially, like the, how they could describe fighting things that didn't exist, you know, or the, uh, the kind of um, the madness of uh, seeing something that uh, you shouldn't have seen. <laughs> <laughs> was uh yeah even you know even now it's i think it still stands up as a pretty amazing pulp writing so people yeah imitating that it's always a uh it always yeah feels a little fan <laughs> fan fictiony or a little little pale uh so christmas said uh changed my pledge yeah yeah flex i wanted yeah maybe a bit of both so yeah some some sdls and some minis yeah i think a um if they could figure out a way to, you know, like if you were a patron, if you're a patron and you could wanted only STLs, um, or if you're a, a patron that wanted only physical, there would be, you know, different options for that. And, and Patreon even has that mechanism now that can track addresses and track shipments and stuff. So it could work, but yeah, that's, uh, it's too bad <laughs> that, uh, we're gonna have to wait and see, and I just hope they're more open and communicative. They've they've killed the or not killed. They've uh, like put on pause or whatever the Facebook group, which I don't think is good. I think they're a little bit Resnova is a little bit too afraid of um, the criticism and people saying ha 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 or you know what's going on, and they need to be they need to get rules out there. They need to like be 
covering the community and the people that are interested in this game with everything. But I think they're also worried about if they give away the rules and they can't sell rule books, if they give away STLs, then there's no market, then they lose their market for miniatures. So they're, they're you know, just like the, the design of the miniatures, they've got one foot in the past and one foot in the future. And it's really hard for them to kind of reconcile how they want to do things. And they've got, you know, they've, they've got the pressure of a, a licensor, you know, making a licensor happy. Um, which I, which I, I believe uh, they even said was slowing uh, certain things down uh, as they were producing things they needed to get approval for illustrations and things. And a lot of the um, one thing I didn't read from the message is that they had some uh, collaborations and uh, we're going to work with different uh, content creators or people to you know get miniatures painted and, and do things. And that stuff fell through. So they had to decide, are we going to further delay this campaign or just move forward without painted miniatures and all that kind of stuff? So, yeah, in Chris Bennett, yeah, I agree. Um, starter sets uh, would have been would have been the best, and maybe they were just having trouble. Like they should have just given you the option because, of, especially because of how they're producing it, of just pick two factions, or you know, it'll be Dark Legion versus you know whatever your your corp is in a starter set so you have everything to play <clears throat> and then you know throw in the because it's not going to be a retail box so it can just be a bundle and uh just put the you know the counters and everything in there yeah it's just uh it was difficult so uh, my uh, miguel was saying uh, my pov about warzone was that uh there was very little incentive to pledge high if the goal was 50k the uh why would should someone bring extra people or pledge extra if they're not getting extras? Yeah, I think that was the the problem was saying no stretch goals and no um, no discount for you know an all in like you're not getting a better deal uh, for getting everything. That really did slow down people's enthusiasm. And no stretch goals means that you you can lose momentum and then it's just gone. And when they were doing the unlocks, I think they were calling them. Um, they were not well documented and they would just kind of suddenly appear in updates. So we didn't know what created that as a, as a, someone that pledged a backer. Uh, we didn't know what caused this and what, what we should do to make it happen more. And if you're increasing your pledge, like you're really not getting any you know, in this, it was hard to understand like what we were getting for what was going on. Uh, yeah, but it's just, it's, it's difficult. And if retail at the same time and uh, is done as the pledge fulfillment, why join a Kickstarter right, right, right after 50k was reached? That's another real problem too, and that's starting to happen more and more. Is these companies are barely able to fulfill Kickstarters before they're going to retail? So you could have just waited and got a store discount, you know, got a 20% discount <laughs> from a hobby store um, or online retailer. Uh, that would have been cheaper than the Kickstarter anyhow, and uh, you wouldn't have had to pay the money, you know, two years in advance or whatever. So that's becoming uh, difficult is knowing whether it's worth it, especially with the larger companies. If they're definitely going to retail, you can probably get a better price. If it wasn't an amazingly successful project, you can get it on clearance, you know, so it's going to be even cheaper. Yeah. So Miguel say, I agree with starter sets, give new players an idea. Uh, who hates whom and so on. Yeah, that's a good, that's true. Theme, theme some starter sets, theme some bundles. Yeah, like, you know, the battle for uh, uh, Venus or whatever. Yeah, have things that are uh, 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 specific to the lore. I think, yeah, I think that really got people excited and, and interested in, in digging into the lore. And they should have, they posted a couple of stories on the Facebook group and stuff, but they should have just been dumping uh, lore and excitement and, and promoting our <laughs> lore videos or just, you know, doing something to, uh, uh, get people uh, that have no idea what this is and think it's a 40k clone or something to uh, to really look at Warzone. Yeah. So we will see. I wish the design they designed the minis yeah, to the new artwork. Yeah, yeah. We're, we'll see what they come back with. Um, the frustrating thing is they've you know they've already paid for art. They've already paid to have the rules done. They've already paid for miniatures. So that this is going to be a further expense that hopefully this, they can somehow recoup. The unlocks were just add-ons, not freebies. Yeah, for pledge levels. That's right. Yeah, everything was. Uh, and shipping. <laughs> yes. Miguel and I had a conversation. I talked a little bit about uh, before the cast. Yeah, 19 pounds to ship a 120 pound uh, uh, British pound uh, priced Siege of the Citadel to Japan. Yeah. Yeah, and all of this 
all of Warzone is coming from North America. So they've already said they're producing it domestically. So the books are being printed. The books, books and cards and miniatures are all being done in America, which means it could be expensive uh, to where we're going. Whoa, 140 to ship to Peru. Yeah, that's too bad. They're, they're clearing out uh, Siege of the Citadel and no one can uh, afford to get it shipped to them. It's just the, um, the size of those uh, games is just very unwieldy. And, you know, they never went to full retail. Or maybe the, the core box may have. But, yeah, I don't think the expansions and things ever went to full retail. A lot of them were just brown paper, brown cardboard, corrugated cardboard. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, Warzone shipping uh, if yeah to Japan probably would have been brutal. And uh, depending on the timing, like if... if Things were produced in the next couple of years. Yeah, I'm sure shipping is still going to be insane. Yeah, no, I think you're right, um, Miguel. A lot of companies, uh, especially uh, RPG, I think Goodman Games and uh, Chaosium uh, have already said, yeah, we're just North America only. So, yeah, I have to have things forwarded. So I have to pay for domestic shipping in America and then have it forwarded to Japan. So, yeah, it becomes ridiculously expensive. Yeah. Oh, nice. Crispin has two core boxes of Siege of the Citadel. Nice. Well, I'm sure Miguel would uh, <laughs> like to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, things are yeah becoming more and more out of reach just because of yeah economics and, and supply. I mean, shipping yeah has gotten crazy. And I remember when it first jumped, when the, there was a, a, the first kind of fuel price jump probably like 10 years ago, and it just hasn't calmed down since. Yeah, it's really crazy. Uh, okay. But, yeah, I think I'll uh, wrap things up for this week. But thanks, everyone, for joining us. And sorry, we're, we're an hour early. Uh, if Chris's schedule stays like this, we, we probably will try to start it at this time. Hopefully that works. <laughs> it works for everybody. It's not too, uh, not too confusing. But, uh, yeah, it gives uh, another ambulance is going by. Gives us a little bit more time in the afternoon but uh yeah it was good to see everyone avaro miguel crispin and dante thanks for hanging out in the uh the chat and uh morning morning uh the the loss of uh warzone eternal for now we'll see how they come back and we'll see uh yeah if we get uh get some happiness <laughs> and some interesting minis out of all of that in the future uh Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's true. It's good to have. I love the uh, the situation we have now with uh, yeah, people giving away rules and uh, um, and then uh, the uh, uh, miniature agnostic rule sets where you just have to buy the rules and then you can use whatever minis. All that stuff is real good for being in Japan and fighting all these bad shipping prices. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, a special thank you to all the patrons and members that are, are listening to this uh, on the uh, the Patreon RSS feed. Thank you so much for your support, and Demiel, our, uh, our newest patron, thanks so much for uh, supporting us, and we'll continue to bring you good stuff. The uh, Chronopia prologue video is almost finished, so uh, all you patron people and uh, uh, members as well, the uh, YouTube members, you get to see that first, so... We've got a lore video for Cronopia coming up very soon. So thanks again, and we'll do this again next week. So take care, everyone, and we'll see you then. Goodbye.
Zone.